Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today, I'm going to go over the Spill Prevention Control and Countermeasure Plan. With this presentation, I'm looking at just providing a general overview. There's a lot of details if you go into the rules and the amendments and changes. This is just meant to give you a general understanding of the regulation. Um, I'd like to start off by talking about the background of spill prevention control and countermeasure and how it really came to the point it is at now. So starting off in 1973, the oil pollution prevention regulations were originally published and that was under the authority of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, which has later become the Clean Water Act. With these regulations, they were hoping to provide requirements for prevention, preparedness, and response to oil discharges. Um, it also required facilities to implement a spill prevention control and countermeasure plan, shortly called SPCC. With the SPCC, so they originally came out in 1973, but in the late 80s, there were two spills that really drove for further clarification of these requirements. One notable one was in 1988, we had the four off Pennsylvania oil spill. And with this spill, a large container of oil ruptured, spilt, reached into the Mongola River in Pennsylvania. These are just some picture examples of the spill. So they had a large above ground storage tank split open, spilled out, ended up reaching the river. In this picture, you can see the buoys for them trying to contain it from going further downstream. With that spill, EPA formed the SPCC task force. And the job of this task force was to examine the regulations for oil spill and oil prevention. Um, along with this task force, the governor of Pennsylvania also had the GSO looking into the regulations in addition. In response to the task force reviewing and going through these regulations, they provided recommendations. And with these recommendations, there were revisions and amendments made to the oil pollution prevention regulations. These re amendments and clarifications were finalized in 2002. So in 2002 is really when we saw the hard standing point for SPCC requirements for facilities. Since 2002, there has been numerous amendments to the SPCC regulations. And it was clarifying the requirements, providing um, tailoring specific requirements in the rules. This is just a timeline to kind of show you the evolution of SPCC since 2002. So in 2002, we saw that final rule come out and published. Since then, over the last seven to eight years, they've published amendments, put them out for public comment, got comment back, made more amendments. In, a, in response to the requirements. And finally, up there in January 2010, we see the finalization of these amendments and the SPCC rule amendments becoming effective. With that effective date, they set a compliance date for all facilities of November 10, 2010. Um, we'll later go on to the compliance dates and, uh, and review them what a facility has to do later in the presentation. So that kind of gives you the background where SPCC has been, where it's going, and now it is being required by facilities with that November 10 compliance date. But what is the purpose? Why do we have these SPCC regulations? Well, with SPCC, they're providing requirements to facilities for prevention, preparedness, and response to oil discharges trying to prevent oil spills from reaching navigable waters within the U.S. Um, with that then, you may ask yourself, what is a navigable water? What do they define as a navigable water? Is the creek next to my house? Can that be considered it? So in the Federal Water Pollution Control Act, they actually define what navigable water is. And this is going to be any interstate waters, lakes, rivers. If you have a small stream that has fish near your facility, this is what we're looking at. For 
applicability. So with the SPCC, how do you determine if your facility is required to implement an SPCC plan? If you calculate your aggregate to total of oil products on site and you find you have capacity exceeding 1,320 gallons of above ground storage tank, then SPCC could be applicable to you. When you're calculating this aggregate total, you want to include any container that's 55 gallons or larger that exceeds that 55 gallons. Um, and again, these are oils that if were to spill, if you were to have an accident, could reasonably get into navigable waters in harmful quantities. Also applicable is if you have above ground or underground storage tanks exceeding 42,000 gallons. So we're saying, okay, I've calculated my aggregate total. How do I know it could potentially reach these navigable waters in harmful quantities? Harmful quantities, if you want a further definition, is defined in 40 CFR Part 110. I have a short one here. And they're defining harmful quantities as a discharge that violates water standards, causes sheen, discoloration, could cause some harm. It could seep or leach into groundwater systems. When you are calculating to determine if you meet the SPC regulations, your aggregate total, there are some exemptions that are listed in the amendment. Um, I'm not going to go through each exemption here. This is a list, but there are things. If you are calculating it and you have containers under 55 gallons, that's not going to be included in your aggregate total. If you have um, hot mix asphalt, hot mix asphalt containers, this is also an item that's exempt from the SPCC requirements, and you won't include in calculating that aggregate total. Once you go through and you determine that aggregate total and you see SPCC is, I'm required to implement a plan, you then are further going to define yourself based on that aggregate total into a category. There are three categories, qualified tier one, qualified tier two, and all other facilities. These categories have different requirements and different levels of SPCC implementation. And I'll go ahead and go through each category and what the requirements are. If you calculate that aggregate total and you find that you have less than 10,000 gallons of oil storage capacity on site, you have no containers that are 5,000 gallons capacity or greater, and you haven't had a reportable oil spill within the last three years, you are a qualified Tier 1 facility. If you calculate that aggregate total and you find that you have less than 10,000 gallons and you haven't had a reportable incident within the last three years, but you do have a storage tank that exceeds that 5,000 gallons, you are a qualified Tier 2 facility. If you calculate that aggregate total of oil storage on site and you're greater than 10,000 gallons, you're going to fall into that all other category. As I said earlier, based on these categories, there's different levels of implementation and requirements for you. So let's start off with the Qualified Tier 1 facility. With the Qualified Tier 1 facility, again, we calculated our aggregate total. We're less than 10,000 gallons. We don't have anything 5,000 gallons or greater. Well, then we're going to allow you to complete and self-certify a SPCC plan. You can self-certify this plan and create it using a template that they actually provide in the regulations. It's Appendix G of the SPCC regulation. The template is designed to be a simple SPCC plan. We realize, okay, you have less oil storage capacity on site. If you had a spill, you may not be affecting as much as some of these larger oil storage facilities. 
So it eliminates and modifies some of the requirements, giving you a more streamlined plan. The Appendix G template is going to include items such as facility description, a self-certification, five-year review, storage container capacity, secondary containment, section text, testing, record keeping and training, security, and emergency procedures and notification. This is just to give you an idea of what you may see if you pull out that Appendix G template. So it gives you lines with questions that you can fill in for your facility. And again, this is a template that you can self-certify at your site. There's different items you can check off, and it goes through and ensures that you have the necessary means to prevent and, and be prepared in response to spills. The next category is our qualified Tier 2 facilities. With the qualified Tier 2 facilities, again, your aggregate total is less than 10,000 gallons. So with this, you can create a hybrid plan. So you either have a self-certified plan or you may have parts of it PE certified. And with this plan, you are going to create it with the applicable requirements of 112.7 and subparts B and C of the rule. With this subparts B and C and being a qualified facility tier two, it provides additional requirements for you, unlike the templated tier one. Additional requirements for drainage, storage tanks, facility transfer operations. So what does 112.7 include, this regulation? If you're implementing this Tier 2 plan and you go through 112.7, you're going to include items such as physical layout, you're going to have your diagrams, covered materials. It's going through and evaluating and saying, okay, I have these oil storage areas. Do I have the correct measures in place to prevent and minimize the spills? We want to look at, okay, what are your discharge prevention measures? Do you have contact lists and forms if you had a reportable release? Is there security on site to prevent vandalism or, you know, potential disgruntled? With the Tier 2 facility, again, you implement all of the 112.7 requirements. But you also have the addition of subpart B and subpart C. Subpart B provides additional requirements and um, best management practices based on your facility category. So all facilities implement the 112.7. And the subpart B then, you look, OK, what type of facility am I? Am I an onshore facility that doesn't do production? Am I an onshore oil production facility? Am I an onshore oil drilling and workover facility? Or am I an offshore facility? Based on what category you fall into, the subpart B will list out your additional requirements. Um, as I was saying earlier, some of the requirements include for subpart B, designage of facility drainage systems, design of secondary containment, drainage for secondary containment, inspection, testing, um, regular inspections of above ground valves, et cetera. Subpart B, so I said, if you're a Tier 2 facility, we're going to implement all 112.7 and subpart B and subpart C as applicable. Subpart B lists additional requirements for if you have animal fats, oils, and greases, et cetera. Um, if you have nuts, fruits, oils, and the requirements are similar to subpart B. It's just based on different oil categories. So you have the qualified tier one facility that has the template SPCC plan that you can self-certify. You have the qualified tier two that has, you meet the 112.7 requirements and subpart B and C and you can self-certify or the hybrid plan have some part PE certified. If you are determined to be in all other facilities, so I calculated my aggregate total and I'm above 10,000 gallons. 
and you're in the all other facility category. You are required to prepare a professional engineer certified plan. This is in accordance with 1127 and subpart B and C. So basically, we are going to do the same requirements as a Tier 2 facility, except we're adding that PE certification of the plan. Again, the 1127 requirements included your diagram of your facility, your response procedures. Based on the category of your facility, our subpart B added additional requirements for design of our drainage systems for secondary containment, et cetera. Well, with the all others, again, PE certified the whole plan. When the PE certifies this plan, he is certifying, one, that he knows the rules of SPCC and it can properly evaluate the plan, that they have visited the site, they have seen your operations, they have seen your secondary containment, they have evaluated these methods, your procedures, your construction, and that these were done in accordance with good engineering practices. Um, that you implemented applicable industry standards and that you're meeting all the requirements of the SPCC rule. Um, they're also looking at, is this plan adequate for the facility? Was it written appropriately? Are there procedures in there for inspection and testing of these? Now going in, that was going through the different requirements for each facility. Before we get into the compliance states, one thing I do want to note is I said Tier 1 facilities, you can self-certify your plan. Tier 2 facilities, you can self-certify your, certify your plan or have parts of it PE certified. There are three states. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head. I believe it's like the Dakotas, and that, that will not allow PE certification. And so that's one thing you want to watch out for if you're in one of those states. With the SPCC regulations, so they came effective in January, they set a November 10th, 2010 compliance date for all facilities. So if you were a facility that started operation on or before 2002. Hopefully, you have an existing SPCC plan in place. You're expecting you should have known about it by then. So what you're going to do is maintain your existing plan and maybe make amendments if um, some of the rule changes that were finalized affect your plan. And you're going to want to do that again by the November 10th deadline. If you're a facility that started operation after August 16, 2002, and up to November 10, 2010, you want to prepare and implement an SPCC plan no later than November 10, 2010. If you're a facility that's in the construction process, you haven't started yet, and you're starting after November 10, 2010, well, then you're going to want to prepare and implement an SPCC plan before you begin those operations. One thing to note on this is if you're a new oil production facility, they're going to give you an additional six months after the start of operations, realizing, you know, your oil flows and that could vary within that first six months until you really get it stabilized. Now, currently, the date is set November 10th, 2010 for all facilities. I did speak to Mark Howard, and I believe he said that EPA is going to try to push to move these dates out and give it extension. However, that has not been finalized yet. We don't know when that's going to happen. So right now, you're stuck on that November 10th, 2010 date. So the SPCC is federal EPA's requirements. Well, I also want to point out that there are states that have adopted um, similar SPCC requirements. As a note, federal EPA has not delegated the SPCC requirements to any state. So they're in control of that SPCC regulation. With that, that means if you are in a state that has adopted their own set or similar regulations to SPCC, 
you are going to be required to implement the federal EPAs, make sure you're meeting that, but also meeting your state requirements. I've listed some examples up here of some states that do have their own oil prevention requirements. So, for example, we have Pennsylvania that has the PPC plan. We have New Jersey. Louisiana has a plan. Florida. Um, there's about a handful, and this doesn't include all of them up here. So depending on what state you're in, you'll want to check to ensure if your state has additional requirements. Again, if you meet the requirements for the federal EPA's SPCC plan, you must meet those requirements, implement the plan. But your state might have additional stuff you need to look at. Um, this is just some resources. Now, a few things I don't have up here. There is a hotline for SPCC. In talking to Mark Howard, he said, if you had a question about that hotline, you can call, and they answer about 90% of the questions. They can get you, get you an answer. There's about 10%. If they can't answer it, they'll pass it on to the EPA folks, and they'll get back to you on that. Um, that was all I had. That's a general overview of spill prevention control and countermeasure plans. Um, I hope you found it informative. I'm just trying to make everyone aware, give them a general guidance of this. Is, these are here. They have a requirement of November 10, 2010, so we all need to be moving if you're meeting, if you're applicable to implement these plans and get them up to date. Um, at this time, I believe we're going to open it up for questions. If you have questions specific for me, then I can go ahead and take care of those. If you would like to ask specific to Mark Howard, who's tuned into the webcast, um, you can send those over. If we cannot get to your questions, my email address is up here. You can email me your question, and I will get right back to you. I'll get you a response on what you have a question about. Okay, we're going to go ahead and take a five-minute break, and then we'll get into the question and answer period. Testing. And I won't be able to name them all off the top of my head. I don't know. Okay. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. If we could round everyone in the office up, and then we have folks on our webcast if you want to join back in. We're going to open it up for a question and answer period. One thing I'd like to know on the question and answer period is with FTCC, it's really kind of specific to the category of your facility. So some questions I may get, they may be specific to the category of the facility. And so to keep it kind of general for everyone, those ones I may need to answer offline or send you an email about the specific responses. Okay, so the first question is, does this plan apply to animal fat rendered tallow as an oil and subject to the FCCC plan requirement based on exceeding aggregate totals? Yes. And it absolutely is. Okay. Yeah. Next question, is it correct that the oil and lube oil systems for compressors or similar equipment should be included in the on-site inventory for determination of tier level? There are um, some requirements for oil filled equipment, but there are also some exemptions in this 2009 amendment that came out. Um, I do believe in that case you would require it, but you would specifically have to go and look in that amendment to determine because there are a few exemptions. Next question. Are there annual reporting requirements for Tier 1 facilities like there are for, two, um, for Tier 2 facilities? With the SPCC, there are inspection requirements. In general, the plan is required to be reviewed every five years. Obviously, if you make a major change at your facility, you're adding additional capacity, or you're reducing capacity, you'll want to go through at that time and update the plan. 
Um, in, there, in the checklist, it will guide you on the specific inspection requirements, and I think that's what you're getting at. Specific inspection requirements are going to have different time frames. They may have a six-month period they want you to look at your containment, check it out, walk around. They may have some monthly, and that will be right in the checklist and provide you guidance. Is bulk soybean oil included in this regulation? Is, I'm sorry, what was bulk that? Bulk soybean oil. Bulk soybean oil. I'd have to look specifically into that oil. I believe it is. And yes, Steve, thank you for chiming in. That is included. With that, with the regulation, it's it's not a new amendment that I believe it's been around. Right. Do the SPCC requirements apply to oil only, or does it apply to any other hazardous material? Right now, this applies to oil or any material that could have oil in it. Um, there are different requirements for chemicals. There are some people, and I talked to Mark about this, that like to include additional chemicals in their SPCC plan, just to have it in one place, have the information. But right now, the SPCC focus on oil or items that could pertain an oily solution. OK, and, and the, does that include diesel fuel? That's all the questions I have right now. Is there Anna? any questions in the audience that you would like to ask? And if not, we'll be hanging around for the people that are in the office if you want to talk offline about anything. Um, anyone joining in by webcast, if you find you start thinking about this later, I do it all the time. I may not have a question right now, and I start thinking about it. An hour later, I come up with something. You can reach me on our East Coast office number at 610-619-3524. You can also call into our offices, 949-282-0123. And um, we can go ahead and provide you additional guidance or by email. And again, there's also the EPA has a hotline that if you have a question, you can ask them too. And I think we have one more question before we head off. Yeah, I will be blasting that hotline to you all before, um, right after this question. The question is, is there a pro prohibition against a PE certifying a plan for his own facility? I have not seen it. There's no, that's kind of a misconception that they label about, okay, well, who does the PE have to be? Does it have to be a PE within the state? You just need to have a PE. There's no specification on it can't be someone at your facility. Obviously, if you have a PE at your facility and you want them to certify your plan, you want them to be objective. So you don't want them going out there and saying, well, it kind of meets it. You know, you guys are almost there. I'll go ahead and certify this. You want to make sure you really go through and evaluate the requirements and ensure the plan's adequate for the facility. In Cal, oh sorry. Okay. In California, the question is: In California, is there specific specific requirements? Excuse me for PE certification. If, if independent. independent certification. Um, I have not seen that in the California regulations. Steve, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, actually, for, for the California folks, uh, the, sorry, Steve, we're looking here. For the California folks, for uh, the California Above Ground Petroleum Storage Act, they simply reference the 40 CFR 112 SBCC regulations. There is no requirement for an independent PE or a PE of any particular uh, area of practice. Right. Uh, it's not like a hazardous waste right. tank certification. Uh, but for the California folks, keep in mind, particularly for the Tier 1, Tier 2 folks and many of the other facilities, the larger facilities, EPA may not get to your facility ever because, you know, they have resource limitations. Right. Uh, but starting this year, every local agency, every CUPA, whether it's fire department or county health, they are starting their mm -hmm. SPCC inspections this year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, expect to get, right. you know, in, you know, inspected where, you know, nobody's been inspected before. 
Right. Uh, another good source of information for the California folks is contact your local Coupa. They've all been trained. Uh, you know, they're a very good source of information too about the California requirements. But keep in mind, you want to prepare a federal plan, right. not just one for for California. Right. That was one thing I did mention in the presentation is that the federal EPA has not delegated this plan to a state. So say you are meeting your state requirements and you think you're covered, you still need to go through and ensure that you're meeting those federal requirements in addition to your state requirements. Yes? Does the PE certification need to be by a person holding a license in any state or a license in the state in which the facility is located? I believe there's some misconceptions about that. So it can be any PE certified. Of course, you want to try to get someone from your own state. but um, when I was looking through the EPA guidance and different misconceptions, it doesn't say a specification on it being a state-required PE. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. I hope this was informative. And again, if you have any additional questions, go ahead and email me. I always like to chat. You can call me, too. Thanks. <laughs>